Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started with our prelude music now, so just everybody focus in, and we'll have another chance to say hi to everybody this morning. And, uh, well, here we go. I need to get my microphone on my ear, don't I? There we go. All right. So it's good to have Dan and Marv with us today. Dan leading our worship. So let's worship the Lord today. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Driving alone just to face temptation's call. Tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Tell me where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend just to help me in the end. Tell me where could I go? But to the Lord Neighbors are fun Oh, I love them, everyone We get along in the sweet accord One when I pass That chilling hand of death Tell me where could I go But to the Lord Tell me where could I go, seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend just to help me in the end. Tell me where could I go but to the Lord. Life here is grand with friends I love so well. I get from God's own word. But when my soul needs manna from above, tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Tell me where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Just to help me in the end Tell me where could I go but to the Lord Where could I go? Tell me where could I go Seeking a refuge for my soul Needing a friend just to help me in the end Tell me where could I go but to the Lord? Tell me where could I go but to the Lord? It is finished, said my Savior, as he hung on Calvary. All the awful pain and anguish, suffering there for you and me. Oh, that humble, blessed Savior, he had wrought salvation's plan. See him as by God forsaken, hanging there for sinful man. It is finished, it is finished, my salvation full and free. Jesus paid the debt for sinner when he died on Calvary. It 
It is fear, you said, my Savior, having filled the lost dead man. Three days hence and resurrection, all of life at his command. Call on him, the true redeemer. Won't you trust the Savior now? Turn from all your sins to Jesus at his feet. Come humbly bow. It is finished, it is finished. By salvation full and free. Jesus paid the debt for sinners. When he died on Calvary, it is finished, it is finished, my salvation full and free. Jesus paid the debt for sinners, when he died on Calvary, when he died. of the Lord today? Yes. It is a good thing. I tell you what, take just a moment and find out the name of the person close to you, so that uh, behind you and before you, so that you can pray for them by name when we do that uh, later on the service today. Go ahead and, and uh, find out your names there. 
It is good to see everybody today inside your uh, bulletins is a connection card. So you take that connection card out and fill it out and you can put it on the table back there where you picked up your uh, communion elements. If you haven't picked up your communion when you came in, uh, feel free to stand up and go back and, and uh, get your uh, communion. You also leave your offering to the Lord uh, there at, the, at that table. And if you prefer to give... Uh, electronically, you can go to our website and go down to the bottom there and click on Donate here and make your donation in that way. Up on the screen is going to be a slide that says text the word hello to this number if you're a guest here today. We invite you to do that and we'll, the uh, automatic responder will respond back with a message for you and to, to greet you uh, as well. Uh, today is the day that we uh, collect our $1 offering. Uh, uh, if you have a buck to spare, the uh, envelopes are at the end of each pew. It's a little love uh, envelope. And uh, you can put that into the offering as well. And it goes for uh, homeless ministry and to help with uh, needs as, as people uh, contact tact, tact us as well, uh, as well as it goes to Jacob's Well uh, Ministry. <clears throat> this coming week, I encourage you to read through Ephesians chapter 6 several times as uh, we are uh, starting that chapter today, but uh, we're going to be delving into it even more uh, next week, so continuing uh, to do that as well. Our missions moment for today is South African Christian uh, Mission, and uh, Dave would normally give this report, but he is over in Hillsdale preaching today. Dave Faust and uh, Debbie and Tony and Suzanne are over there, worship team, and I think uh, Theo and Don are over there, and maybe Benji and Lynn are going to drop in over there. So we got a good contingent uh, supporting the church over there in Hillsdale as we uh, pray for them. So uh, in, on your pink sheets, uh, there's a, a blurb there about the South African Christian Mission uh, pray as we ship many Bibles uh, that God will bless as stated in Isaiah 55, 11. That is how it is with my words. They don't return to me without doing everything I sent them to do. As we ship thousands of Bibles uh, to SACM, a South African Christian mission, pray for God's blessing. I talked with Dave this last week. And he said the barn is filling up. Bibles are continuing to come in every week. And he's sorting those things out. And let me put in a plug for Dave. Sometimes he gets a little overwhelmed with how much there is to do out there. So if you like to sort books and reorganize things, uh, Dave could use your help. He just needs to be able to ask for it. So I'm going to ask for him. How about that? All right. So let's, uh, ha let's pray for, South, uh, for the mission, SACM, and then we'll stand and have our uh, morning scripture together. Lord, we think about our missionaries all over the world, the work that they're doing today and reaching out to people in your name. We pray, Lord, especially for Steve Zimmerman and the Gospel 101 team and the work that uh, the churches and the college uh, are doing there. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we can provide Bibles and Christian literature. And uh, we pray, Lord, that that uh, you, will, you will fill this barn up so we can send another container soon, this fall. And so we're looking forward to doing that, Lord, for the kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, and uh, together we will proclaim uh, the word of the Lord. Uh, let's do it together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. 
Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at His command they were created. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and He He has has raised up for for His people a horn, the praise of all His faithful servants of Israel, the people close to His his heart. We're going to remain standing. This song, Everlasting God, we have a God who is start to finish Savior. He is start to finish King. He is start to finish our advocate. He's the one who stands for us. He's the one who is for us. He's the one who will always be our strength, our constant, constant help. Let's sing together. God, you 
you came, we pressed so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. We sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Lord, take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. statement in this next song, Whom Shall I Fear? If God is for us, who on this planet or in the universe can be against us if a God is for us? We celebrate that God. <laughs> shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, no troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side, the one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine, the God of angel armies is always by my side. alone can save. You will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind me. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hand. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful, you are faithful, you are faithful, you are faithful. I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Always by my side. 
everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations Savior, He can move a mountain My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I give my life to follow, the Savior I believe in, Lord I surrender. the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light in let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Savior he can move about God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. You can be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. We have an often, often, awesome, awesome father. I'll get it out there in a minute. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sometimes we men that do meditations up here, we go through the week and we're searching for the words, the scripture that uh, might be beneficial, uh, uplifting for the congregation, for our fellow, our family. And this week was one of those weeks that Monday, nothing came to me. Tuesday, nothing. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The last night I read through four New Testament letters. God still didn't say, no, that's not what I want you to share this morning. <laughs> so this morning I picked up Kim to bring her to Sunday school. And while I was waiting for her to come to the car, I went to Colossians and I Okay, this scripture sounds like it a fit. Thought I had it. It wasn't until Sunday school class that I finally got the scripture that I'm going to share with you this morning. So God's amazing. Yeah, his timing is perfect. You know, I sometimes wait until the last minute. So I'm relieved that he finally <laughs> connected with my spirit. So I'm going to share with you uh, John chapter 6, verses 43, 47 through 54. Then John 17.3. Uh, I started my month-long service uh, bringing the communion meditation to you, and the first one I remember was from 2 Corinthians, and I, we talked about how we must discern that the blood is the blood of Jesus Christ, the wine, the fruit of the vine that we take. 
is his blood, and we must discern that. And the bread we take is his body, and we need to discern that. So this scripture fit right in with that. And I've got messages popping up on my phone here. So starting with John 6, verse 47. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which every, anyone that eats... I didn't say that, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews begin to argue sharply among them themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat my flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last days. Going to John 17, and I'll paraphrase it, what is eternal life? And John 17, 3 gives us the answer, because that's what we... That's what we're getting here when we partake of communion in the body of Christ and his blood. Eternal life is knowing God, our creator, in Jesus Christ, his son. So I'll have a prayer, then I'll give you a few minutes to partake of your communion and your own personal meditation. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have provided a way that we can have eternal life. And it's through partaking the flesh and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to know you more deeply. And you are an eternal God, and will we ever know you fully? I doubt that. So you've given us eternity that we will have the time to know you fully. In Jesus so we thank you for providing for us a way for eternal life and as we partake of this loaf and this cup may we do it in remembrance of you in Christ's name I pray amen Our scripture reading for today is Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. I see we have some children out there over in this section. I don't think we have any over there. For you children, listen up for the first three verses are, is God talking to you, okay? So, so pay attention here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which, get this, it's the first commandment with a promise, so that you may, so it may go well with you, and you, that you may enjoy long life. And I want to emphasize that. Not just have long life, but you're going to enjoy it, okay? So obey your parents, and that's the promise. You'll enjoy your long life here on earth. We got a few fathers out there. This is for you guys. Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
Well, we don't have a lot of slaves out there, but we are to esteem one another above ourselves. So in a sense, you could say our brothers and sisters maybe were slaves too. But there's some good points and some principles here. Slaves, obey your earthly master with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only when, to win their favor when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he is both their master and your master in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Amen. We have been worshiping today. We've opened our hearts to the Lord. And now you get to do something really, really important. You get to pray for your neighbor. Part of worship. This is not where you receive at all other than you're the people that are praying for you. But this is really where you give in praying for your neighbor. Do you know what's going to happen with your neighbor this week? You don't even know what's going to happen with you this week, right? But oh, how we need God's help, right? We sing that song, oh, I need thee, how I need thee. So let's pray for one another by name, lifting each other up before the throne of God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your very presence among us this morning. We honor you this morning with our lips and our hearts because, Lord, you deserve our highest praise. You deserve the best that we can give you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, for your forgiveness, for your loving kindness, for your patience, for all that you've given to us, for the inheritance that you're providing for us. And we pray, Lord, that as we walk into this week, that we will keep our eyes on you. That we will make your presence, our, the, the knowledge of your presence, every day a part of our lives. So that we can know, Lord, that uh, we are receiving your wisdom and your strength and your help. Whatever it is, whatever circumstances come our ways, we pray for our neighbors that live around us. So many of them, Lord, Lord, far from you. And we pray, Lord, that circumstances will happen in their life that will draw them close to you. That they would turn their eyes to Jesus and look full in his face. We pray, Lord, that you will open up our eyes and ears this morning as we open up your word and allow you, Lord, to speak to us today. That we'll be encouraged and strengthened, uh, not only for this week, but in the days to come. Lord, there are many ways in which our nation is in turmoil. And we pray, Lord, and we thank you for the work that you have done even within the last 50 years, and people working and praying, uh, Lord, for uh, your mighty hand to move. We know, Lord, that you are the God of life, the God of everlasting life. And we thank you, Lord, that you are ever, always at work among us, even if we don't see it. We know you are, Lord. 
Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are greater. Thank you, Lord, for your presence among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brian's going to come and share a song now. Brian, did you write this song? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> with some help. Yeah, for sure. Well, come and share your heart with us. What if Moses had not been born? Would we still have the Ten Commandments? What if Abram had been robbed of life? Would Israel have been established? If Mary had never existed, did God still have found favor? If the blood we spill had been spilled in that day, would the world still know a Savior? Every life that begins has a purpose and an end. Every seed that's sown, God surely knows. Every heart that beats is heard by God. Every womb that bears fruit, He bestowed. And what if the world had not known Paul? Would we still have the books of Scripture? The Gentile race still know of God's grace. I think you can get the picture. If mommy and daddy decided that the timing just wasn't right, if the blood in your veins had been cast away, the world could never see your light. Because every life that begins has a purpose and an end. Every seed that sown, God surely knows. Every heart that beats and is heard by God. Every womb that bears fruit, He bestowed. Every life that begins has a purpose and an end. Every seed that sown is meant to grow. Every heart that beats. Is heard by God, every womb that bears fruit, He bestowed. If mommy and daddy decided that the timing just wasn't right, Thank you, Brian. Our God is a God of life. You glad you have your life? Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. What I want you to remember is Paul is writing a letter here. There, when he was writing the letter, he did not say, okay, chapter 6, verse 1. That's not the way Paul wrote the letter, right? Um, 
So what he is doing is he is continuing the, the thought that he was writing, as we know, at the end of chapter 5. He, he just continues to write. And uh, he con- he, what he's doing is he's continuing this thought that he began in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So last week, what we learned is that there is an attitude of humility that God intends for his people. And this humility begins with Jesus Christ. We went to uh, Philippians chapter 2, and we learned that Christ showed us what humble submission is. He didn't hold on to the glories of heaven, but he humbled himself, becoming a lowly human being, and he submitted himself to the horrific death on a cross. And then after that, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Now, we sing that song, Lord, I lift your name on high, right? That song just reminds us of of what Jesus did for us in coming uh, to earth. So Jesus did everything that he needed to do to make his bride the best that she could be so that she would reach her her full potential. Who is Jesus' bride? There you go. So this, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Have this attitude in yourselves. The attitude that Jesus had. And so Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 is essentially teaching that same principle. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's a message to the church. Church, think Jesus. Serve one another. He came and served us. We serve one another. And then he, go, he went on to say in verse 22... And wives, to husbands as to the Lord. Very interesting. I started looking at the nitpicking of the, of the language there. And the word submit is not repeated in verse 22. It says in 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in, in 22 it says, and wives to husbands as Christ loved the church. In other words, what? Wives, think Jesus. And then to husbands, he said to them, husbands think Jesus. How? Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so today, as Paul continues on this thought, we will cover children, slaves, and masters. And what Paul is saying is submit to the master our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Obey him. And then it says to children, obey your parents. Slaves, obey your masters. And masters, obey the Lord. Jesus himself even told us that humbleness is a part of his nature. If, you were say, if, if I were to ask you the question, what is Jesus like? What are some qualities that you would throw out there? Well, he loved people, you know. And we might run through the, the uh, fruit of the Spirit. This is what Jesus was like. But what did Jesus say? He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am what? Gentle and humble of, in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So there we get two other qualities that Jesus tells us this is what he's like, gentle and humble. So when we're united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection, we receive his spirit. You know, when we receive the spirit of Christ, who do we receive? Christ? Yes, no, maybe? Okay, yes. So if we receive Christ, we receive his nature, his character within us, right? And so we too have the absolute capacity for humbleness and gentleness as well as love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and so forth. This is the nature of the church. This is what Paul is saying in, in chapters 5 and into this, and, and 6. This is the nature of 
the church. So Paul continues on and says to the children, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. In other words, children, think Jesus. When it comes to your parents, you also think about obeying Jesus. Jesus as well. Why? It's the right thing to do. Everybody knows that, right? It's the right thing to obey your parents. Jesus honored his father and mother. You are to honor your father and mother. The word that Paul uses here for obey is a stronger word than the word submit. It's a, it, it requires a, a stronger action for it's it, it, Paul is increasing the intensity of what he's saying. Children, do this. Then he gets to the slaves. He says, slaves, do this. Obey. Do what they tell you to do. This is right and you'll live longer. Is there any parent who wants their kids to die before they do? Is there even the strictest of parents, parents who are really, really strict, do they set their rules so their kids will die early? No. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? We want our kids to live. So that's one of the reasons why it says you can trust your parents, and if you do what they tell you to do, you're going to live a long life, because that's the don't do this, kid, or you'll get in trouble, or you'll do something bad, or you'll mess up. So do what's right in the Lord. The emphasis for the kids and for the parents is in the Lord. In other words, think Jesus in your family relationships. So, kids, Jesus loves you, and so do your parents. They love you. Do what they say. Parents, love your kids like Jesus loves your kids. That's your model. But it goes specifically to fathers. Because Paul knows in every, every generation throughout human history knows how important fathers are and how, how important the way they bring up their children, how important that is. It can either build them up and encourage them for life, or it can defeat them. If a father does not have words of blessing, does not have words of encouragement, does not have words of building up, fathers think Jesus when you're teaching your kids. Don't exasperate them. What does that mean? Don't be unreasonable in an unreasonable way. And specifically, don't provoke your kids to anger. Don't poke. Don't prod. Don't irritate. Don't anger your kids. There's a different way of getting a better result. Have a different approach when you train them in the Lord. That's the key, isn't it? In the Lord. So here's some observations that I want to give for just a moment. Dads, teach, train, guide, and instruct. You do it. it it's, it's not exclusive to you, but don't shirk this responsibility. So Paul says, men... Love your, love your wives like Jesus and train your kids to love Jesus. So many times, I've seen it happen so many times, strong men allow others to do the praying, to do the reading, to do the leading. And too many men, too many men who are believers in Jesus will have very little to do with the church. And this is the church that Jesus is building. Jesus says, I came to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we have men who say, I'm not going to engage. I believe he's the Savior. 
I believe he came and died for my sins. What, let me ask a question. What is it that Jesus wants? Not what do I want, not what the little leaders of the church want, not do what, not. The only question that really needs to be answered here is what does Jesus want? What he wants is for each dad to be a model of what it means to be a Christian who is totally committed to the Christian community. Am I wrong in that? I don't see anybody raising their hands. Here's a second observation. This scripture is not saying don't be strong. Be strong. Just don't be abusive. That's not his will. Actually, in the Lord is a study in what it means to have self-control, right? Jesus was the model of self-control. So when we train in the Lord, when we model in the Lord, we are modeling self-control. Here's a third observation. Some of your uh, versions use the word discipline. It's not a bad word if you understand what it's saying, but unfortunately, because of where our culture is and the way we hear certain things, we'll read that word discipline and think it means punishment. It does not, not, not mean punishment. There are many disciplines. You see, that is exactly what the opposite of what Paul is teaching here. Paul is not teaching punishment. Paul is teaching what does it mean to train a child in the Lord. There are many disciplines. You have been probably trained in a discipline. I've been trained in the discipline of pastoral work. There's a discipline of education. There's a discipline of electrician. There's the discipline of plumbing. There's a discipline of IT. There's a discipline of nursing. There's a discipline of farming. There's a discipline of mechanic. It's a, a discipline is an area of study that you become an expert in, right? That's the, that's the discipline. That's what Paul is saying here. The word is Padme. The, 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 the instruct the student in the discipline. What's the discipline that Paul is talking about? You say it. In the Lord. That's the discipline. In the Lord. So when one is disciplined, if I'm a disciplined person, does that mean I go around beating myself? No. It means that I am very strict with myself as to what I allow in and what I train myself in, and when one is disciplined, they act within the strict guideline of rules and behaviors to be the best that they can be. That's what it means to be disciplined, right? Moms and dads, discipline is how you live your life for the Lord. One of the disciplines of the Christian life is to go to Christian fellowship and enjoy the fellowship of the believers, right? This is one of our disciplines that we do. Think Jesus. Now, we are living in trying times. There have always been trying times, but we have our unique circumstances. Raising kids in the era of cell phones and social media is a new animal to tame. If your circumstances have a child that's way out of control, has gotten caught up in addictions and worldly behaviors, very Strong actions are needed. And we can go back to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Be wise. Think Jesus. We do face some tough problems. And, but there's a way to do it just within our own wisdom, and then there's a way to do it with godly wisdom. Oh, May the Lord give us his wisdom, and we learn it here, right? This is the discipline. This is the discipline. Okay, now we're going to move on to slaves. And uh, it says slaves, uh, let me get to Ephesians here. Ephesians 6. 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. We'll get to this in a minute. Slavery, people, slavery has always been a part of the human condition ever since mankind has figured out how to take advantage of other people. as pretty early on, wasn't it? Every culture has had slavery. Many cultures in our world today have slavery. People enslave their own countrymen as well as foreigners to them. You name the nation, and there has been some form of slavery in that nation at some time or another. What God did in the book of Leviticus was to set respectful parameters for slavery so that indentured people People would not, would not, would not be treated cruelly, would not be indentured for too long, and would be treated with respect. As a matter of fact, God allowed for a person to indenture themselves for life. They're talking about they would take an awl and pierce their ears. That's where you find piercing in the Old Testament. When a person wanted to endear themselves, indenture themselves, become a permanent slave servant, to their master for the rest of their life. It would be their choice, though, to do that. So slaves could actually also become a part of the family, and in some cases the slaves would be the one to receive the inheritance. In God's system of allowing slavery and servanthood among humans, He wanted people to be treated with respect. Forced Subservience is not God's plan. Voluntary servanthood is God's plan. Remember when Abraham was telling God that he would have to give his inheritance to Eliezer, his servant, because he had no children? I mean, here he was. He was, he was the slave to Abraham, and he would be received. God says, no, 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 no. I got a better plan. And that's when... Isaac came along. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to fast forward to the New Testament. Now think through this. As Paul would go from town to town, he would preach Jesus Christ as Lord. Slaves would come to know Christ. Masters would come to know Christ. And uh, Paul is writing back to these churches and he tells them how to live as Christians, whether their situation is one of being a slave or whether their situation is one of being a master. As we move forward in history, I'm just kind of having, this is a kind of a sidebar thing. So Paul's writing these letters. Peter also addressed the issue of slavery and so forth. As God's word would go out to the nations in the world, guess what? God's word would speak to the culture of the day. Whatever the year was, Whatever the culture is, God's word speaks. It's, it, it, it is timeless, and it is so broad. It's wonderful. So now, in our 21st century context, we can understand Paul's instructions. Uh, Jerry kind of gave a little bit of thought to it. But we can understand this section in the idea of employees and employers. But I, today, I don't, I don't want to settle on that thought. I just want us to know, yes, we can apply it in that way. But as we understand more of who was Paul writing to, and why was he writing to them in this way, we can under, in that way we can understand more of how it applies to our day and time because God's word is timeless. So now, as we read through this, I want you to notice. Notice how Jesus is central to Paul's instruction to the slaves. Because see, the, the slaves have given their lives to Jesus, but they're in this circumstance, right? So what do we do? They love and they, they want to serve Jesus. So Paul says... Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and 
with sincerity of heart. And then who does he point to? You say it. Jesus. Just as you would obey Christ. Then he says, verse 6, Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but then who does he point to? Jesus. But as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving who? The Lord, Jesus. Not people. Because you know the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. It's amazing to me, and I've done it myself sometimes, how we can read a passage of Scripture and emphasize what's not emphasized and not emphasize what is emphasized. And I'm pointing out to you what is emphasized if we're talking about slaves, but Paul is saying, think Jesus, think Jesus, think Jesus, think Jesus, and how you act and react and how you live your daily lives. And Peter says, even if you're even if your masters are cruel, you serve them in this way. Because you know the Lord will reward you. This is so crucial for the, pe for the, for the people that Paul is writing to. And it's really crucial for us today as well. For all cultures at all times. In your job... In the people that you're in relationship with, if somebody has authority over you, live for Jesus in that relationship. It changes everything. It changes your mindset. It changes your attitude. It changes the way you approach it. And, and, and you go, well, that's not fair. That's not right. Okay, now we've got to go back to Philippians chapter 2. And think, now what did Jesus do for us? He wholly and completely humbled himself for us. And what did God do for Jesus? He exalted him. So if in your human relationships and jobs and all that, you live for the Lord Jesus, even though they can be wholly and totally wrong in the way they do things, there's a reward coming. There's a reward coming for you in the way that you will employ yourself to those in authority over you. We must know this, though. God does not condone the mistreatment of people, ever and period. You know, it is in the Christian system that people are created equal, and with, with all other ethnicities, and they and everybody is to be treated with respect. It's because of Christianity that slavery has been abolished in some countries. You don't find that happening with other religious systems. You don't find other religious systems abolishing slavery. You find them encouraging it. It is only in the Christian system through the ages and through the years that people have been able to be brought out of that and then Paul turns to the masters and he says masters as soon as I get there treat your slaves in the same way don't threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and there is no favoritism in heaven I find that really interesting that he doesn't say the Lord or God or Jesus. He just points to heaven and says, him, him. Your master, masters, is in heaven and he's watching. Do not threaten. Do not threaten. So masters, I'm giving you the same instruction and I gave everybody else. What do you think it is? Think Jesus. <laughs> That's right. Think Jesus. Now, this completes the thought that Paul started back in chapter 4, verse, verses 17 and 18, when he said, starting this whole section, 
I insist in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So from living your individual lives at home to living your lives in the world and living your lives within the context of the church and living your lives in the way that you make your living, walk in the way of love. Number one, walk in the way of love. And number two, humbly serve one another out of reverence for Christ. And then that whole section between 417 and 69 are a lot of specific ways to do that. The worship team would come up. You see, folks, God has blessed us with such incredible blessings that we read about in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Incredible blessings. So now, you can live your lives out of the riches of the blessings rather than trying to simply eke out an existence in this life out of the poverty of your human circumstances. If your human, stance, human circumstances aren't very good, it doesn't mean that you can't have a blessed life in the Lord. It means that the Lord is going to use you in a specific way where you are. And the way that you do that is to think Jesus. So all of us this week, let's make him our focus this week as we face the circumstances of our life. Whether our life is controlled by a cruel taskmaster or whether you have the privilege and responsibility of helping people from a position of ownership and leadership. Different responsibilities, but the goal is the same. Honor the Lord. And we're going to sing. We're making this personal, folks. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord to you. So let's stand and let's sing. It's not, it's not just sing a song. Let's, let's pray this prayer as we respond to what the things that we've been learning today in relationship with one another. Lord, take my life. And let them be 
this week, folks. It's the best thing you can do. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Everlasting God. Strength full rises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength full rises, we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong healing.